Hi everybody, Doc Locke James here. I'm a sports scientist and senior lecturer at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. And today we're going to be critiquing the one and only Ronnie Coleman's training. Yeah, Ronnie Coleman is considered the greatest competitive bodybuilder of all time, or second greatest compared to Arnold. Now he was certainly the most dominant relative to those he was competing against at the time. He won a record eight Mr. Olympias and was an absolute freak to behold on stage. Now, Ronnie was noted for training exceptionally heavy for a bodybuilder and for emphasizing powerlifting actions like the squat, the deadlift, and the bench press to a greater extent than any other bodybuilder. Sadly, since his retirement, we've seen Ronnie's musculoskeletal health deteriorate significantly to the point where he's essentially wheelchair bound. When compared to other Mr. Olympias who came before him, like Dorian, Lee Haney, and even Arnold, who are all in pretty good condition for their age. This is actually pretty alarming to see of Ronnie. So let's have a look at his training to see if there are things that could have been done differently that might have helped reduce the extent of the injuries he's experiencing today. Now, as a sports scientist, my job is to prepare athletes for competition. And while some sports have an aesthetic component like, say, gymnastics, diving, ballet, for example, none are as entirely aesthetic like the sport of bodybuilding is. So we aren't typically involved. But a long time ago, I did compete in the sport, believe it or not. So I'll try to draw on that alongside my more formal knowledge to give my two cents on this. All right, let's kick it off. Pretty good psych up. So the deadlift, that's a cornerstone lift in strength training. The first thing I noticed just here is that he used a touch and go rather than a reset method. In the traditional method, which is the reset method, the bar needs to come to a complete stop for a brief period of time, roughly about a second or so. Now in the touch and go method, which is what Ron is using, this pause is removed. All right, so what's the difference? There'll be greater utilization of the stretch shortening cycle in the touch and go method because the eccentric phase from the previous rep will potentiate the start, which is the concentric phase, of the next rep. Now there will be some of this in the traditional method, but not much. This increased stretch shortening cycle utilization in the touch and go method that Ronnie's doing probably won't be a big advantage for pure muscle size. Also, for a given load, the time under tension during the concentric portion of the lift will be greater in the traditional method than in the touch and go method. So if all things are equal, this would be advantageous for muscle growth. Also, interesting to see only two reps performed, which is great for maximal strength, but volume alongside the heavy loading is needed for muscle growth. It's possible this might have been just for the camera. It might also, though, give some accurate insight into his regular training practices. A key driver of hypertrophy is the volume load, so the interaction between the weight lifted and the total volume. So performing doubles like this would require an incredible number of sets to get the volume in. Also, while great for a whole body, whole system strength and transfer to sport, from a bodybuilding perspective, the downside to the deadlift would be you can't really target or isolate with the lift. So from a bodybuilding perspective, I'd be using the deadlift to provide doses of strength amongst a program with a primary focus on muscle size. The increase in strength from this will allow greater load to be lifted for a given volume and therefore a positive transfer to hypertrophy training. All right, next up looks like we've got bent over row. All right, Ronnie, let's see what you've got for us. All right, that was a bit of a mess. Again, it's a great exercise to use, but it's pretty clear he's rocking a whole lot at the hip, which is just gonna take the emphasis away from what he's after. Look, you can throw around a lot of weight when doing this, but it's not gonna help muscle growth when compared to keeping the hip fixed. Also, his torso is too upright. I'd be getting his chest over further, keeping it fixed there to hit the meat of the back. 
rather than what he's doing here, which is almost just like a shrug. This will give the opportunity to work through a greater range of motion, and that's going to be advantageous for muscle size. So I'd be queuing for that for sure with Ronnie here. The consequence of doing it the way Ronnie is, is that he needs a lot of weight to get any sort of stimulus for adaptation. So this means you get a, a great magnitude of stress on the body for probably a, a not great adaptation response. All right, what's next, Big Ronnie? Looks like we've got uh, the 800 pound squat. All right, here we go, this will be a bit of fun. That's a psycho. Still going. Down, 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 up. All right. Famous scene there, uh, most people would agree that's a pretty ugly squat. Didn't really hit depth, didn't complete the rep at the top. We know full ranges of motion, particularly through long muscle lengths, seem to be preferable for stimulating muscle growth. Again, he only knocked out two reps, which makes it hard to get the volume in. The magnitude of tension is high from the heavy load. Now this is typically a good thing, but the volume is low unless he's doing dozens of sets for this lift. So all this indicates how hard it is to emphasize the big structural lifts that are typically reserved for low volume in a setting where a combination of high volumes and moderate loads are needed. While these lifts can be a big driver for adaptation, they are also highly fatiguing and place a massive demand on the axial skeleton and other joints. Now this is amplified when reduced ranges of motion are used because even greater loads are needed for a stimulus. And this has a disproportionately large increase on the stress or the fatigue on the musculoskeletal system. All right, so just imagine this with your own training and the load you need to lift to fail on let's say a set of three in the quarter squat versus a set of three in the full squat. The loads would be massive in the quarter squat with relatively low demand on the leg extensors, but at a whole system and musculoskeletal level, it's gonna be hugely taxing. Okay, next up is an insane leg press from Ronnie. Let's check it out. Cycle up again. Alright, that's a start. And he's going to do a full rep. Alright, there's some excellent partial reps there by Ronnie, but again, we're missing out on a full range of motion. And this reduced range of motion is what allows a lot of weight to be moved, but there's going to be limited stimulus for muscle growth combined with a huge cost on the musculoskeletal system. So consider that the key driver of hypertrophy is the mechanical work performed. Now this is the product of force and displacement. Ronnie is obviously producing high forces here, but the displacement that the load moves through is really small, which is impeding the mechanical work that can be performed. If you took, I don't know, let's say a third of the weight off and move through the full available range of motion, which is at least double what he's doing here, he'll be performing greater mechanical work at a reduced cost to joints and other structures, yet would produce a greater stimulus for adaptation. So all this compounding over decades at the highest level in bodybuilding probably played a role in Ronnie's condition today. Changes I'd recommend for those competing in bodybuilding or physique competition is a greater inclusion of machines to promote adaptation with a reduced structural toll. This will also allow for more targeted single muscle specific stimulus as well. Interestingly, this is actually the opposite of strength training to prepare for sport in some ways, because the goal is to target the system as a whole when training for sport, mostly. And also, strength training time is limited in sport because they have their actual sport and sport training commitments to deal with. In these cases, a high stimulus and a high fatigue toll from the strength training component is acceptable. Also in sport, while at times 
The short and medium term goal may be to increase muscle size. The end goal generally isn't this at all, but rather it's explosive strength or power expressed in their sport. So the athlete will move through a hypertrophy phase, but spend the vast majority of their resistance training time in strength power development. In these cases, the volumes are relatively low compared to Big Ronnie here, and these key structural lifts become the primary feature of training. Thanks for watching everybody, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a like and subscribe below for more content on its way.